All right. Welcome to another episode of Sandhill Road. And I'm super excited to announce my guest today, Spencer Kimball, who's the co-founder of Cockroach Labs. Spencer, ready to take us to the top? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And I'm so honored to have you on just one week after being on Jason Calacanis' show this week in startups. And I learned from, from his show that you're based in NoHo in, in New York. But where does this podcast find you today? Today I'm uh, out in East Hampton, which is on Long Island, kind of uh, really close to the end of Long Island. It's uh, nicely bucolic here. Weather's great. It's uh, nice to be out of the city, even though uh, the city's actually got some pretty good energy in uh, August with all the outdoor dining and no tourists mucking up the works. So let's talk a little bit about Cockroach Labs. The company has announced in the midst of the corona crisis an 86.6 million Series D funding led by Alameter Capital and Mary Meeker's bond fund on the spectrum of startups who have COVID headwinds and those who have COVID tailwinds. From the outside, it looks like Cockroach Labs is really placed within those bucket of companies who've really benefited from the large move online, providing part of the backend infrastructure of the internet. But maybe give us a little bit of a highlight of what Cockroach Lab does, the two-minute pitch, and how it has fared through the crisis so far. Yeah, absolutely. And with Cockroach Labs, we're, we're building primarily a, a relational database. So in the tradition, the long tradition, it's been 50 years now, of companies like Oracle, uh, IBM with DB2, Microsoft with SQL Server, the difference is that Cockroach has reimagine the relational database to exploit the cloud. Right? The cloud is what's fundamentally different. And we're not really breaking, we break some new ground, but we're also following in the footsteps of Google, who did a lot of this R&D uh, over the decade that I was there in 2002 to 2012. Uh, and really what, we're, what, we, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, well, the cloud is fundamentally about making resources frictionless. And those resources can come within a data center, which is sort of the traditional way to think about building software. Everything runs in one location. Uh, so you can get lots of machines. You can get them in minutes. Keep in mind that back in the day, this used to take months for a company uh, with a new team spinning up a new service to allocate machines, get them put into some co-location facility. Now you can get these things in minutes and you can get them programmatically. But you can also get resources, not just in a data center, but across data centers. For example, in availability zones in AWS on the East Coast. And this lets you do really fancy things with replication uh, so you can survive a, an entire data center going away, which is a huge advance. I mean, when I say survive, I mean, you have maybe a several seconds of latency, but no chance of data loss and just complete business continuity. And then you can even extend the idea of what the cloud gives you further and say that the cloud can give you frictionless resource acquisition, even across continents. So, you, you know, even a startup these days can have customers in the EU, in the US, in Australia, how do you give all of them a first class user experience? And the cloud at least is telling you, hey, we can give you on AWS or GCP or Azure or Ali Cloud or whatever, we can give you resources across continents. We can cover the entire world and you can get those all programmatically and within minutes. It's kind of this amazing thing, but what about the old databases? Because Oracle can't use that stuff. That's not, it wasn't architected for this era. It was architected for decades past. So we, we, there is a brave new world, but you really do need to think of infrastructure differently to really build that next generation of applications and services. For example, the way that Netflix or Facebook or Google builds things, right? If you're using Netflix and you're an Australian user, a customer in Sydney, you don't have a crappy experience where you're jumping over to Virginia every time you're trying to access uh, the back end of Netflix. You're actually accessing the servers and the data and the applications, and it's all stored close to that customer in Australia. That's what everyone wants to build in the next decade. But so far, that's been sort of the province only of the super high-tech growth companies. And now that's sort of a, a becoming a democratized capability. And you know, Cockroach is building the database, which is a critical Part of any application stack uh, that can actually accomplish that sort of uh, data architecture goal. Super exciting. And let's talk about the, the early days of Cockroach and getting the band together. If I think about the perfect founding team, it's a team that has deep domain expertise in a field, who has worked together for years, maybe even started a company together before. And your team had the fortunate position to have all of these ingredients in one place. You did your, your undergrad in computer science at UC Berkeley. Go Bears. While at Berkeley, you built the, the graphics editing tool together with your roommate, Peter Mattis, who you met there and who is now also a co-founder of Cockroach Labs. 
And then later on, both of you co-founded Viewfinder, which was later sold to Square. From an outside perspective, this looks really like the perfect band. But maybe you can add some color to how this, this team came together. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you did mention two startups that, uh, that I've done. There was actually a third, which I did right out of college. Actually, I, I had two jobs before, but they were both pretty brief stints. Um, this is during the dot-com boom. Uh, I learned each step of the way, sort of the, the do's and the don'ts. And I do fundamentally believe that any entrepreneur with fire and a passion for something can be successful right out of school. Um, you know, but there's advantages to doing it when you've had a lot of industry experience and you've seen the problems up close and personal. You did mention it's great to, to have worked with people before. I think that's actually what I would say is the most critical point. And one I give as advice to anyone that asks me <laughs> if they do want my advice, which is being in the trenches with uh, you know somebody else and really you know seeing the highs and the lows and particularly the lows and um, still having a lot of respect for that person in terms of their work ethic and their temperament when things are aren't going so well and even when they are going well, you know people can turn pretty horrible sometimes when there's a lot of success at hand. Uh, you know that actually forms the basis for a uh, a level of trust that is essential, uh, it, it, you know, throughout the the difficult, you know, twists and turns of the startup experience. And in those first two startups I did, you know, before Cockroach, you find or you mentioned there's another one called WeGo Systems back in 1999. All of those, uh, those two original ones were done uh, it, partly with people that I knew. In each case, one other person, um, and and then. Uh, partly with people I didn't know well. And in both of those cases, the people I didn't know well, those become, became major points of contention uh, where when things weren't going so well, uh, those nascent relationships didn't really have the, the deep and abiding respect and trust that I think is necessary. So with uh, if you find effort with Cockroach, we've had, uh, you know, Peter and I have been working for 27 years together and Pete, Ben and I have been working for 18 years together. So we have seen it all. We've worked on so many different projects you know, throughout the art years at, at Berkeley, as you mentioned, and at Google and at Viewfinder and so forth. That, that was that was hugely important and uh, a, a big piece of advice that I think holds true no matter whether you're doing a startup out of college or, uh, you know, after 20 years in industry. And, and, and I think the other big thing, I mentioned passion. I think there are cases where people get sucked into startups, especially as a technical co-founder, where the goal of the startup, you know, the, the raison d'etre, is not something that the founder is necessarily passionate about. Like sometimes they're trying to put on the hat of, uh, the, you know, the customer that they, they've never been. Right? Maybe you're doing a, a healthcare startup, and you kind of understand why people would want it, but you. You know, haven't had that much experience yourself as you know whoever whoever it is that you're solving the problem for. I think that puts you in a dramatically less viable position. It's so much better when the passion that you have for something is born of your own frustrations, and you really understand the customer journey and where it's going wrong and the problem that you're solving. Those are the two pieces of advice I think are, are critically important. And with Cockroach Labs, boy, we had we had those in spades, right? We had a, we had an incredibly uh, incredible history of the founding team and also in my entire career after graduating from Berkeley has been fundamentally one of fighting against the shortcomings of databases. So, you know, to finally work, con you know, concertedly on just that problem and really solve it from like, what would I most like to see from a database? Uh, the next time I'm on the side of building an application and all of those things that I've learned over 20 years, um, I've kind of come to a head in Cockroach, so that's super exciting, and it, and it gives you the necessary drive to keep on plugging away even when things are, uh, you know, getting getting difficult. So you sold Viewfinder to Square, and then after a year or so, you went to your co-founders and said, "Let's do it again." How did these conversations go? Were they like, "Oh, oh man, let's just rest and vest for a bit"? How did these conversations go? Yeah, it was a bit of that. Uh, certainly. It wasn't too hard to convince them. I think all of us definitely understood why cockroach should happen. I mean, it, it, when we left Google in 2012, Google felt about 10 years ahead of the larger ecosystem. Just, you know, I think that, that lead has shrunk dramatically. But in 2012, it was um, really apparent that what Google had built with 
big table and then megastore and then spanner this was an inevitable set of capabilities which when we when we did viewfinder we realized wow so many of the problems that we had to solve would be trivially solved if we had a system like spanner but that was only inside google at that point um, when we got a Fired by Square, we realized, wow, Square has problems that also could be trivially solved by Spanner, which they are contorting uh, themselves you know, into knots, really, to, to work around you know, their use of things like HBase and MySQL. It's just not the right solutions when you're, you know, at that point in time, you know, it's 2014. Uh, so you know, the, uh, the conversation with Pete and Ben, I think Ben was more on board than Pete. Pete was... Uh, I think a, a little less interested in just <laughs> doing it all again. You don't get paid much when you're doing a startup, right? We we had a very good situation at Square. Square is a great company. Uh, you know, it was comfortable there, uh, and you know there was uh, definitely a lot of equity still on the table. So you know, leaving wasn't the first thing that we really wanted to do. But it's one of those moments where you, you kind of feel like, wow, you know, if ten years at Google was worth anything, it was this ability to look into a crystal ball ten years into the future. Google being 10 years ahead of the ecosystem, to the extent you think the ecosystem is going to follow in their footprint or footsteps, which we did believe, uh, you know, it seemed like a waste to say, okay, well, we understand what the future is, but we're not going to go and invent it. We're just going to keep on the sidelines. I hear you. If you have this special insight into a vertical or a technology, then you just have to take the leap, right? And I saw that you didn't raise a seed. I think you could probably bootstrap to the first version of the product. What did the first version of CockroachDB look like? Yeah, I mean, well, it wasn't, very, it wasn't very functional yet. The first version, it was something that I was working on while I was at Square. And then Ben joined me and then some other folks joined as well. Some, some that were at Square, some that were I mean, just random people that were interested in the GitHub project. So that was for about a year. So there was something that was viable. There was a design doc that got a lot of interest, which was very helpful. Uh, and that was enough for us not to raise a seed, but to go directly to a Series A, which Benchmark led. And they were joined by Sequoia and Google Ventures and uh, uh, several others. But uh, you know that early project wasn't yet SQL, as an example. And that's something we decided as soon as we actually raised money, okay, SQL is really where the market is. That's what we need to do, not just a NoSQL system. Uh, and, you know, but it was... You know, you had to classify that early version of Cockroach when we raised money as being alpha, and definitely not suitable for production under any circumstances. Um, but enough of a realization of the idea that the GitHub project already had 3,000 or 3,500 stars, which you know the VCs taking a look at that 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 represents something real. That's it's, it, you know interestingly for an open source project like Cockroach, uh, there was still a long way to go. In in terms of the investment necessary to get to a general availability production ready release. Uh, typically with open source projects, you have a situation where, you know, it's stewarded and uh, sort of uh, incubated and then fully you know, brought to production within a company like you know, Yahoo or uh, LinkedIn or Google. And then those things uh, get released sometimes under the Apache Foundation, but it's a, it's a pretty, it's like Cassandra, right? It, you know, there's work to be done still, but it's a, it's a viable piece of software already. With Cockroach, you know, we are still alpha. And a, a lot of the re realization is that when we raise this money, it would be about, uh, you know, creating the necessary R&D to really bring it to market. And that was going to be a multi-year journey even before we could start selling the product. So it really was a leap of faith for our investors. Uh, and uh, a slightly different lead-in to building an actual commercialization uh, strategy around an open source product. Like we had to do the, the investment first in the R&D. Let me double click a little bit on this open source com commercialization. I think in one of your blog posts, you recently covered the three dominant business models in, in commercial open source. The first one being obviously the services model, which was pioneered by Red Hat, which has fallen a little bit out of favor or diminished a little bit in importance. Then there's obviously the dominant one, the open core model, where you have specific premium features that you offer in a paid version. And then there's the hosted model. In this blog post of yours, you mentioned that you see eventually Cockroach Labs adopting 
a combination of the hosted model and the open core model. Talk to us a little bit about how you landed on the open core model and whether you ideated or iterated on some of these other models. Yeah, you know, a lot of these things are just a function of the funding environment and the received wisdom that you have as a startup founder as you go around, you start talking to VCs. VCs are really good pattern matchers, and especially if you're talking to the cream of the crop in the VC world, you know, you take them pretty seriously. And uh, they, they do share a lot of wisdom with you, which is why I think it's important as, in, as a founder to, to not worry about things like NDAs. I mean, ideas are cheap, really. You really want to you really want to sort of pull out the stops and shine a lot as much sunlight as you can on your idea, and you can pick up a lot of uh, interesting opinions along the way, which help to uh, you know form your own opinion about things. But the open core model in 2015 was definitely still ascendant, and you had companies that were doing a good job with it, from Confluent to Elastic uh, to MongoDB, and the you know, the it, it, it didn't feel like the hosted service was, you know, or the managed service was, it had as much traction. Uh, and so, you know, you kind of just fit in where you think that your commercialization is something that's going to attract investors fundamentally. And and the received wisdom in 2015 was open core was, was a prov proven model and it was going to work. Uh, and it, it also felt you also have to look at what it is you're selling. We're infrastructure software, but we're a special category of it. We're a relational database, which is really the system of record, the source of truth. And many companies, for reasons of sometimes uh, you know regulatory compliance, sometimes just a very evolved, maybe decades evolved infosec uh, internal requirements process around uh, you know how their employees' devices are controlled, uh, what sort of uh, regulatory compliance regimes that they have solved all the problems, uh, you know, uh, posed by the, the compliance, uh, you know, using various pieces of software. It's a very tangled web and interconnected. Just moving into a hosted service, the way Amazon was providing RDS at that time, it's a huge lift for an enterprise company. It's, let's say, done 10 years of compliance and regulatory work to get whatever their, their mission-critical software uh, you know, to, to make that work for the compliance regimes uh, within their own data centers and so forth. Trying to lift and shift that into Amazon's RDS in 2015, you know, absolutely not going to happen. So our realization is if we want to sell to this global 2000 enterprise segment of the market, uh, they're, they're going to have to run it themselves. So the host of service felt early. And even in 2020, it's still a little early once you get outside of the sort of high growth tech companies. Uh, and, and that's just the reality. And you always have to, you always have to deal with the reality. You know, as you mentioned, there's the sort of support and services model. That's one that uh, really had fallen out of favor because many companies tried it after Red Hat and very few succeeded. In fact, it's hard to point to one that really succeeded definitively. And even MySQL, for example, uh, kind of went more the open core route, uh, which is interesting because they were, they were very early in the game uh, back in the early aughts, right? So the, the next very exciting one is uh, database as a service. And obviously, Amazon pioneered it. They're very good at it. Uh, what Amazon typically builds for is the growth segment, so not the enterprise segment. They're repackaging open source technologies and, and integrating them with the other services they provide, uh, trying to remove friction in terms of how you can adopt something without having to also become an expert at running it, maintaining it. While the day one plus operations work that's necessary, so you might pay a bit more than you than nominally you would if you're running it yourself. But once you factor in the fact, okay, we have to provide the hardware and the electricity and the trained operators uh, to run it ourselves, then the TCO of a service, especially one where the company like AWS is able to to have a huge economy of scale, can be a, a better TCO, and Amazon can still make money on it. That that is, in my mind, to my mind, the absolute way of the future for infrastructure and for the exact same reason that the cloud the public cloud is is replacing private data centers right fundamentally a company like amazon or google or microsoft can do cloud better than any company on the planet can do it themselves because they their economy of scale is just off the charts right they're, they're so much bigger even than a fortune 10 company with you know like the biggest fortune 10 companies might have 50 data centers around the world but they're shutting those down now because even with 50 data centers they can't do nearly as a good a job or nearly as fast in terms of how they can iterate internally as if they moved all of their application development teams into the public cloud that same principle 
applies to uh, infrastructure software. And like, uh, you know, th it's maybe not quite as complicated to run something like CockroachDB yourself as to run your own data centers, but it's pretty complicated, right? And so trusting a company like Cockroach Labs to run it not just for you, but for many other companies, and therefore there's economy, scales, uh, economy of scale in terms of, you know, how, what are the run books look like? What does the automation look like? What are all the different things that Cockroach has to pay attention to uh, with, you know, 150 customers around security? Uh, is that going to be better than any one company could do on their own? And the answer usually is yes. And certainly I think it applies even more to a company like AWS, uh, who, who's got, you know, 10,000 customers or, or more. I'm not exactly sure what their customer count is. Uh, you know, so that is the future. This brings me to a very sensitive question in open source, which is defensibility. The, the cloud provider, whether it's AWS or Google's GCP, in the past they've taken an open source project and basically repackaged it as their own product. We've seen this with Elastic and with other projects as well. And last year, around this time, Cockroach Labs decided to relicense to the MariaDB license, which is a, as far as I understand, a time-limited license. Talk to us a little bit about what went into this thought process and how you think about licensing in, in open source projects in general. Yeah, absolutely. When we started, the open core model felt extremely defensible. I mean, I should just start by saying I'm a huge lifelong fan of open source and feel like I've benefited tremendously from the model. And at the very least, I mean, there's lots of elements to open source, right? Some people conflate lots of different aspects of it. Um, it only a subset of which are usually important to any particular um, interested party. You know, there's, there's community, there's like prices and free beer, there's whether the ideas are free, uh, you know, in, in terms of, you know, can, and also whether you can fork the code and build your own things, uh, you know, all those things are important aspects of, 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 of open source. And, you know, to, to a lesser extent or a greater extent, I believe in all of them. Uh, so, you know, doing cockroaches open source was absolutely critical. I think mostly because I would never use a database that wasn't open source. Uh, and, and so it wasn't an easy decision to move to what's called the BSL, which as you point out, was, was developed from MariaDB, but of course it's separate from MariaDB. It's not really MariaDB's license, but it's a, something that they worked out. And as you said, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a hybrid of a license. Um, what it does is it kind of gives you what amounts to patent protection for a term, which you can set. It has to be less than five years. We set ours at three years. So for three years, there's certain ex exclusions to the use of the software. And you, you kind of, that's something else you fill in. You fill in the term, you fill in the exclusions. And what happens is when the term is expired for a particular release, it's kind of rolling for every release, right? If we released in April, then three years after that date in April, uh, that that version would become Apache, full open source. Uh, and then let's say we did another one in October, then three years from that October, that particular release that was released in October would become Apache. So it's this rolling three-year window. And what that gives us as a company is some amount of protection for our core. And our core is very powerful, and we don't want to start making our core not powerful. So it's sort of crippleware if you're trying to use open source. We want our core to remain very powerful, and we want it to leave pure open source at the end. We don't want to... Uh, you know, I don't want to squint at the horizon and be like, okay, well, we're going to start putting more free features into the enterprise license. And you're never really going to have a strong open source product. And you're never going to leave one behind. It's always going to be sort of tied up in commercial licenses. That's what we wanted to avoid. And BSL is great for that. The other thing, you know, I mentioned this list of exclusions. If you keep that list, if you put zero things in the exclusion list, then you'd, you'd essentially have an Apache license. And the three-year thing would would be there, but it wouldn't make any sense because it wouldn't protect anything for three years because there was nothing to protect. So that, that list of exclusions is, if it's empty, it's equivalent to the open source license. We put one exclusion in there, and I think that's also important. How many exclusions do you have in there? Uh, ours is just one, which is you can't run Cockroach uh, as a database as a service externally. So anything else you want to do, forking the code, you can resell our core uh, as shrink wrap software as licenses and provide your own support for it. Um, you can modify it, fork it, do whatever you want. The one thing you can't do is run Cockroach sort of uh, as a database as a service uh, for commercial purposes externally. So a company like Netflix, for example, could use Cockroach Core internally and provide it as a database as a service as a service to their internal development teams. That would be totally allowed. So it's very permissive. Uh, it's just that one 
exclusion. And really, the way I think of that exclusion is in, uh, you know, sort of an anti AWS RDS exclusion. And I don't, you know, I don't mean to just single out Amazon, although they're, I think they've been the worst actor in terms of destroying the open core business model. Uh, but you know, it applies to any company that would uh, take a uh, take our core and uh, essentially you know, be able to compete with us. And, and we just want that protection for three years, which I think is the is a reasonable window for where we can stay ahead on the innovation and always make it, hey, if Amazon wants to take something that's three years old and run that in RDS, no problem. But our version at that same period of time is going to be three years better, which, you know, that that's kind of puts the onus on us to keep innovating. And I think that's important as well. Another really interesting aspect about open source that is often discussed by more the the salesy commercial people is that open source can really act as a top of the funnel engine. And I listened to a podcast episode with James Weitzman, who was a former director of commercial sales at Cockroach Labs. And he developed this, the why, try and buy method for buying and selling open source software. And what he mentioned there, which I found quite interesting, is that he can oftentimes really skip over the why question and start at the try question start selling a customer base that is really acquainted with the, the basic version of the product. Talk to us a little bit about these benefits of, of the open core model. I would, I would go further and say that you would hope that they actually get to the, the try aspect as well. I mean, that's something that we track every time uh, there's a potential opportunity and we put it into Salesforce, you know, some sort of commercial buyer, we're tracking how, what percentage of those opportunities have done their own technical evaluation already. Right? Because that, that adds a lot of time to the sales cycle. The technical evaluation can take three months easily. Uh, if they've already done that, then our, our job becomes significantly easier. And uh, you know, that's, that's a, a critical aspect of the open core model. And to the extent that's working, uh, you, you know, that's pretty much, that's one of the biggest reasons. That, that's when your open core model is really working. So uh, the... Yeah, you want to get them all the way through try and essentially what you'd like ideally you would simply collect uh checks is the buy part and you know obviously that starts the next stage of the journey where you're providing the right support maybe professional services uh they have you're unlocking the enterprise functionality that they they may want to graduate to um and, and you, you've just you've taken out the the why which is i would classify as education and the try which is sort of proof of technology proof of concept and that's what open core has been for for as long as this existed. And that's, you know, open source became the dominant model, not because I think people wanted the ideas to be free. Although, you know, I'm more of an idealist and I, I feel that that's, that's uh, you know, definitely a factor for me. I think most people adopted open source and turned it into the dominate, dominant paradigm because it was cheaper and easier and faster. That's probably the biggest one uh, to adopt and to deploy. But before it would take months of procurement and, uh, you know, uh, arguments with salespeople and you know procurement departments and MSAs I mean, we, we deal with all that stuff it, it's pretty painful uh, w with open source you get to skip all that as the developer um, but increasingly the service based model so uh, not services but you know cockroach as a service or database as a service that is a faster way to deploy right because you don't have to download the open source and then learn how to run it you merely start using it and somebody else is doing all of that running for you. So it's faster. And, uh, you know, it is, I think, quickly becoming the dominant consumption paradigm. And so that's something that now Cockroach uh, has to adopt as well. It really to, to I think, uh, be a big success in the 20s, the, the 2020s. You know, you, you, you fundamentally have to uh, provide that consumption mechanism. And... I think, you know, the, the big opportunity for Cockroach and for all companies that are providing infrastructure as a service is to make that uh, as frictionless as possible. And that's something that we're, we're working hard on. I think personally, the beauty of open source uh, wasn't just that it was quick to download it and try it. It was also free. And developers care about free beer, not just free software, but free beer, right? They, they, they don't want to put credit cards down and so forth. So to my mind, what you really need to do in the 20s with a database as a service isn't just to make it really frictionless to try something out, but to, but to take that a step further than just, hey, we're going to run it for you to say, hey, it's going to be free. In fact, it's going to be perpetually free. 
for, for all but sustained usage, right? At that point, you start to graduate people into consumption-based billing and eventually into, uh, you know, for the biggest type customers into their own clusters, uh, which are more expensive and have better enterprise features, enterprise SLAs around support and, you know, fixing problems and so forth. So, but that free thing is, is it matters. And I think in order to really capture developer mindshare and the hearts and minds really of developers, you have to give them that better consumption model and you have to make it so that they're not putting down their, their credit cards. It's just crucial. So in the next section, I want to talk about the financing journey of Cockroach Labs. And I listened to this podcast again of Peter Mattis, who said that you are really the natural born fundraiser. And that you've been crucial in leading all fundraising rounds of Cockroach Labs so far. If I look at your funding history, one thing that's that's quite striking is that you skipped the seed round entirely. A number of people call this a Pegasus if you're able to skip one critical financing round. And I assume you managed to do this because you you still had funds left from from selling your other company. And then in the summer of 2015, you raised uh, your 6.5 million Series A, really from the cream of the crop of the venture world, Sequoia Capital, Benchmark, Firstmark, and Google Ventures. So talk to us a little bit about how this round came together. This must have been a, a hugely oversubscribed round. How did you eventually decide to go with these firms? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, we were originally going to raise a seed, but uh, the interest level was so great that it, it ended up making more sense to raise more. Uh, it's just a, a faster acceleration uh, in that sort of initial takeoff phase. How many people are you going to hire? Uh, how quickly can you start to develop the product? Uh, you know, all those things mattered. Part of the reason we were able to do that, as I mentioned earlier, is that we had some decent traction already with the open source project. And, and that level of interest for you know what was essentially something that was going to be inspired by Google Spanner. So Google had also done a lot of education before us in terms of the paper that they'd written about Spanner, which was very well received. And you know there were VCs that were watching. Okay, when's the open source Spanner going to show up? Right, and that that definitely was uh, you know, something where I'd consider us to have ridden on Google's coattails in in a, in a way like the fast following is always a very good um, strategy. So what we ended up doing is we, there's this really great uh, early stage investor named Lenny Pruss, who at that time was at RRE. He then went to Redpoint. Now he's at Amplify. Uh, he has his finger on the pulse of basically everything that happens. If you haven't had him on, you really should uh, have him on. He, he's amazing. I mean, he, he knows every research group at all the major universities, any kind of project that has uh, traction. He is all over it. He knows all the principles. Uh, he, he's he's amazing. So he he actually gave us our first term sheet, and uh, you know we took that and we said, well, this is kind of fast and amazing. Uh, he, you know he saw the potential, and we we decided, okay, we probably should go out to Silicon Valley and find out, you know, if other VCs are interested. And uh, you know, one of my actually my my only and first intern. <laughs> Uh, Eric Nordlander was at Google Ventures at the time. And, you know, he also encouraged us, like, hey, come talk to Google Ventures. I think he gave us, you know, the names of some other investors and things. And, and you know, really was, I think, a, a driving force in telling us, okay, you guys have, you, what you're doing is definitely something that should get funded and you, you should have a lot of success fundraising. So we went out and it everything fell into place pretty quickly. And I think we were out there for several days. And like, everyone we talked to, uh, you know, maybe... <laughs> You know, modulo a, a few, uh, you know, naysayers was extremely excited excited about what we did. So yeah, it was oversubscribed. You know, fundamentally, we included Google Ventures and Sequoia because we just really liked uh, the some, the people that we interacted with there. But you still you have to choose a lead, and and for us that was you know some combination of reputation, uh, the sort of chemistry. Between, because this is going to be the first person on your board, right? So you just want that chemistry to 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 be excellent. And, and when we talked to Peter Fenton at Benchmark, uh, his you know, his belief in what we are doing and his uh, you know obvious intelligence just really kind of blew us away. And Benchmark has such a fabulous reputation, especially for you know getting that first check in and and having uh, a really good track record there. It felt like uh, you know that was a pretty easy choice for us. And so, yes, it came together very rapidly. 
having that first term sheet, you know, if anyone's out there looking like uh, thinking that they're going to raise money, you know, it's a, it's a great leg to stand on. <laughs> so if you have that first term sheet and you go out and you make the rounds with the people that, uh, you know, that you, let's say, really are interested in, uh, that's a good way to quicken the process and really um, drive sustained interest. And I'm happy to, to see that you also made room in the round for Moisey Oretsky from DigitalOcean, who was also a guest on this show before. And then you went on a year later to raise the Series A extension round where you brought in Index. And I would assume that was Mike Volpe who was leading the round there. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about this next round and, and what kind of milestones you had hit before raising that round. You know, I mentioned before, okay, let's. we decided to raise an A because that was sort of the investor appetite. Uh, and we raised six and change. And you know, pretty quickly, it became apparent that, that like more money wanted to come in. Uh, and, and, and Mike Volpe was an introduction from Peter Fenton, which is, I'd say, a, you know, a, been a learning experience for me. The, the early investors you get uh, will often lead to the later rounds. You know, uh, VCs have a lot of respect for each other. Or they have very little respect for each other. It feels like there's kind of two polar extremes. And you know, to the extent that you start with good investors, I think you continue with good investors. And so, uh, you know, Mike Volpe is someone that Peter Fenton had worked with on many other boards. And they had similar uh, outlook on the on the open source and the open core model and databases. And and so uh, and, and a lot of trust, right? So that's kind of like it. It really helps the entrepreneur in terms of uh, you know how those follow-on investors are already vetted, especially by someone on your board, right? It's difficult if you're going to say on my second round, I know you don't like this particular VC, but uh, I really like them, and now you're going to work together on the board together, right? That uh, listen, I mean, I'm not saying that should never happen, but on on the other hand, it, it does eliminate. Uh, unnecessary friction if uh, you know the board actually has a good working relationship. <laughs> so you know that that definitely did factor in there. And then you raised a 27 million Series B in May of 2018 uh, with Redpoint joining. And then this year you've officially become a late stage startup by raising the Series D from Mary Meeker's new bond fund. It might be. The reason that she was busy closing your round, that she didn't publish her infamous <laughs> internet trends report. I think she, she published a COVID trends report. <laughs> But um, how does it feel to be now officially a, a late stage startup? I think if you're in an early stage startup position, you think, wow, you're really going to have it made when you're a late stage startup. But I can assure you that is not, uh, not how it feels when you're the late stage startup. Instead, the pressure just ratchets. And, uh, you know you have different existential problems than you did when you were in early stage. I think even when you're trying to IPO, it probably feels like that. Even when you've just IPO, it probably feels like that. And it's always from the inside, things always, uh, you know, have uh, you kind of whatever your current set of worries are, they will expand to fill the available space. That is just the, that's just the fact of life, right? It's true in personal life and it's certainly true when you're running a company. So it doesn't feel that much different to be a late stage company, although it does change the kinds of people that you can recruit to the company. Some people that fits their risk profile better. And, and you are dealing with uh, just a bigger company and, and that, that's, it cuts both ways, right? You certainly can get more things done, but well, there's more inefficiency. You have more levels of management. Uh, things you don't change you can't change on a dime anymore you can't turn on a dime right you become more of that aircraft carrier it takes a day to turn around <laughs> uh you know that's that's uh it, it's good and bad so yeah it feels it feels like we've made progress in the early stages it's, it's often still you're selling a vision a mission and then in the later stage rounds many times it feels more like you're dealing with spreadsheets how is it different from an from a founder experience to raise one of those really late stage rounds Yeah, definitely. There is a lot more attention paid to the numbers because the numbers have become more meaningful. And that, I think, only continues to go in the same direction. But I wouldn't credit anyone that says there's no hopes and dreams, uh, no matter what your stage is. I think even in a post-IPO raise, I mean, like these days, these companies, I mean, look at Tesla, right? They're multiple. If that's not hopes and dreams, I don't know what is, right? I and mean, that's, that's a bigger multiple than Uh, you know, anyone except for like a 
you know, we've just made a dollar in revenue as a company and, you know, they're giving us a thousand X or something. You know, that's a, that's a bad example, but, you know, hopes and dreams continue. And it's always an important part in this sort of high growth market. So in these last minutes, I want to take a real deep dive into the technology. Let me describe how I understand CockroachDB. If I would put it in technical terms, I would say that CockroachDB is a robust, serializable, lockless, distributed database. And if I wanted to put it really simplistically, non-technical, I would say that CockroachDB is the atomic cockroach of databases. In order to, to get a better understanding, I want to go back to really the, the early days of, of databases, to the good old MySQL database. It's obviously easy to deploy. It works well if you have fewer requests, but it doesn't scale easily. And this is really where CockroachDB comes in, in my understanding. And so what would happen in the past, according to my understanding, is that you would engage in a process known as sharding. And basically, it meant that you process the data over a number of different nodes, split it into different pieces, shard it. However, this can get quite complex. And I, I heard you mention it somewhere else that Google Ads was basically running on more than 25 shards and it was running into massive problems. This is also why the Google Spanners project emerged at Google because This problem was really only encountered at scale. Talk to us a little bit about the good old MySQL days and how Cockroach has really built this open source version of Google Spanner and how this has in many ways revolutionized how we can store data. Absolutely. I mean, the scale is a, is a big one, right? One way I, I, I like to phrase it for uh, folks that aren't technical is, hey, if you think you've got a $10 billion dollar idea, I mean, it used to be a billion dollar idea, but now I guess people find that to be, there's been a lot of inflation, right? But if you think you have that $10 billion dollar idea, like you simply, you can't use MySQL. Not unless, as you say, you want to do this manual sharding process on your own, which is very expensive. If you're using something like AWS Aurora, which is either running on Postgres or MySQL, this, this solution just doesn't scale, It simply doesn't. We've had customers, especially with COVID, where they were running close to the edge of the biggest node that they could with uh, AWS Aurora, And COVID came along and doubled, tripled their size of their business and overnight. And so their Aurora databases just started cavitating, huge stress and downtime. And so, you know, like the, the lesson from that is pretty simple. Like if, if you're really building for that huge success, why would you start on a, a database architecture that's decades old that doesn't scale? Amazon's built that because, well, a lot of their companies are... Um, you know, uh, smaller growth stage companies, and uh, many of them won't make it to that big scale event. But from your perspective as the entrepreneur, everyone expects their business is going to have that ambitious win. And so, you know, it, it's really about why would you want to re-platform down the road? So scale does matter. You know, you, you mentioned that it was over 25 shards at, uh, on Google AdWords. That was back in 2002 when I started. And I think they started having big problems at about eight shards. Uh, and that was just problems with having lots of different databases you were trying to talk to. And they got up to around 32 by the time I went off that project. By the time they actually replaced MySQL with Ad from AdWords with Spanner, it had gotten to more than a thousand shards. And my understanding is that Facebook operates with more than 100,000 shards of MySQL. And, and so both in the thousand shard case and the 100,000 shard case, you're talking about engineering centuries, maybe engineering millennia over those decades the decade plus that both of those companies experimented or you know utilize those architectures where you're essentially building a database yourself you're using mysql at the l lower level node thing but then you have to build essentially a meta database on top of that and facebook's gone a lot further than google which is why i said engineering millennia imagine that like a thousand plus years of engineering time i mean potentially considerably more i don't exactly know what the stats are for facebook but i, I do understand some of the complexity of the architecture they built and it is It's mind, mind blowing. Now, that's not to say that something like Cockroach could replace what they built. I don't think it could. Facebook is such a massive problem. They did kind of have to build that uh, you know, custom architecture. But there's so much space in the spectrum between where you can get away with just having one node of Amazon Aurora and what Facebook has built. Uh, so you know, I think that, uh, again, look, that 10 years of, of looking into the crystal ball that Google gave, they built Bigtable, the first NoSQL database. Right, and then Megastore, and then Spanner, as a progression of R and D and technologies that solved first and foremost the problem of just burgeoning scale with Google's use cases. And I feel like that is something that every startup that has plans, ambitious plans, should be worried about. 
right? Scale is critically important. This sharding thing is, is a mess, right? It, it, if the database can't handle scale and you try to handle the application layer, what you end up doing is creating complexity. And complexity scales very poorly, right? So, you know, essentially you're saying, okay, we're not just gonna use one MySQL node, or one uh, Amazon Aurora node, we're gonna use two, then we're gonna use four and then eight, you're kind of scaling usually in multiples of two. Uh, and and, and that's, what, that's how we're gonna build things. In order to do that, because the database doesn't handle scale anymore, you just got a bunch of different databases, you're putting some customers on shard one, some customers on shard two, and then the application layer, you've got to route appropriately. And if you wanna do something between two databases, you lose transactionality, which is a guarantee the database gives you. If you wanna query across these shards, you can't either, because there's no meta database that can, that can uh, you know, uh, it's the right term. Um, that can essentially ship the query in pieces to multiple nodes and then reassemble it into one. I mean, you could build something that does that, but again, now you're starting to build a database instead of your application use case. A cockroach, by contrast, very simple. It's a, it's it, to every application that connects to cockroach cluster and the cockroach cluster, let's say has 10 nodes. It's not 10 shards to the application. It's one database, but it's 10 databases large. Right, so cockroach takes all of the complexity that any particular application you know, uh, that's running some operation from an end user, it's connecting into this database, talking to any node it wants, and it gets a consistent view of the entire, you know, uh, 10 nodes put together. So all of the transactionality works, no matter where the data is, even if it's around the world, all of the querying works across all the shards and in, 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 in an optimal configuration or optimal fashion, because uh, the, the database engine itself is aware of where all the data lives, even if it's geographically separated and there's latency involved in that. So you can make amazing decisions at the database layer if you start to increase the intelligence there. So that's, that's the primary reason of moving to a distributed architecture. And I mentioned the other two. So there's scale by far, I think, um, the most top of mind thing uh, in 2020. There's also resilience, so replicating across data centers, and then there's global or multi-region where you're saying, okay, well, we don't just have East Coast United States, we've got West Coast, and we want those both to be like very minimal latencies because we're trying to create a game or something like that, a, a real-time game or a entertainment application or something like that. Uh, and so we want East Coast users to have their data replicated to the West Coast in case East Coast goes away, but we want primarily all of the operations on the East Coast to be serviced on the East Coast, so they're very, very fast. We don't have to jump 80 milliseconds round trip across the whole country. Um, but that extends, of course, to including the EU. But all of a sudden now you're like, okay, well, EU users, both for GDPR reasons and for personal preference, don't want their data in the United States. In fact, the EU courts have just uh, you know, overturned this um, uh, safe harbor provision in the GDPR. Uh, and that's is increasingly true for Brazil and for Russia and for China and for Vietnam. Like for Germany's got more strict requirements and uh, South Korea's got requirements. I mean, the, these things pop up like mushrooms after uh, a big rain, right? I mean, they, it's just unbelievable. Uh, they're everywhere. So that's, uh, I think, the, the critical problem to solve for the 2020s. It's how do, we, how do we build global applications and services? Let me dig in a little bit more into robustness and resilience. And one concept I came across when looking into this is the concept of, of synchronous replication, which seems to be a core feature of both Google Spanner and Cockroach Labs. And the way I understand it, it means that you basically need at least three nodes that are physically separate for this synchronous replication to work. What, what synchronous replication means is that uh, you, know, you need to, uh, before you can commit either a, you know, usually a write or a transaction involving multiple writes, uh, you need to get buy-in synchronously from not just one node, but from, uh, you know, the majority of nodes. In the case, you mentioned three being sort of the minimum configuration for Cockroach. With asynchronous replication, you typically just have two replication sites, and you don't have to wait for the second one to acknowledge the write. It's like, you, as soon as just one responds, and you can say, I'm done. The advantage of that is you only have to wait for one to come back. And if there's geographic latency, that can be very nice because let's say it's 30 milliseconds to, to do that uh, replication round trip. Now that's, uh, that's you know, 30 milliseconds you have to wait in order to get confirmation that your write is now persistent. Um, the disadvantage to this is that you can write to the first replication site 
send off the thing asynchronously to the second replication site, say that the write's permanent to your end user, and then let's say that uh, something interrupts that replication. So in fact, you've only written it to that first site, and that first site goes away. And so then your things fail over, and they start talking to that second replication site, which never got the write. So now you've kind of regressed in, back in time. You've lost that data. And that can cause incredible headaches. It can mean lost dollars and cents. It can mean lost user trust. It almost always means a big displacement of productivity within the organization as teams have to scramble to do postmortems to find out what data might have been lost, what things have become inconsistent in the, in the, in the data schema. Uh, and you, you know, writing sort of one-off scripts to try to correct problems, to refund money. You know, it's a, it's a, it's, it can be a week of lost productivity. And many companies, when they lose a data center, you're not talking about one application that's gone. You're talking about like literally 50 application teams doing postmortem. So it's, it's bad for morale and it's uh, particularly bad for productivity. Uh, that's something that, that's the whole point of doing this consensus-based synchronous replication. Synchronous replication just would not work if you had two sites because you'd have to wait always for that second one to agree. If either of the two were down, you'd be completely dead. Right, because you have to wait for both. It runs down. You can't. It's not going to re respond. So you, you're never going to until it comes back. You're going to be stuck. So that doesn't work. That's terrible availability. So that's why you go to three or you go to five. Uh, the, the thing about having three or five or seven or whatever is that you can just wait for the majority of nodes to respond. So you don't have to wait for all of them. You just need two out of three or three out of five, which means that you can have one of the replication sites completely AWOL if you've got three. Or if you've got five, you can have two whole sites AWOL. And five is a really interesting number because that's how Google runs AdWords now. So in other words, Google can now say for their very valuable AdWords property, right, where you really don't want that to be down. Uh, I mean, they're just going to lose money hand over fist if that's true. You want to make sure that you can have a planned database or planned data center maintenance. So in other words, one of your five sites is gone now because you're taking it offline to say replace some high-level networking or you know power PDU or something like that. So you have a planned maintenance. At the same time, you can have an unplanned maintenance. It's like, okay, we took this thing out. It's going to be out all day Thursday. Uh, and oh, shit, someone took a backhoe through a fiber optic cable that's connecting uh, this other data center that's also part of the replication. Now you have two full data center outages, and you still have complete business continuity because you still have three out of five. That's like an amazing amount of business continuity. And like, that's not the way Oracle and Golden Gate works. Like, and the whole world is on Oracle and Golden Gate. So, you know, what we're talking about is like a, a, a big leap forward in terms of turning what used to be disaster recovery into what's now termed IT resilience. Like, you want to make that transition. Every business wants to make that transition. There's, of course, a cost. I mentioned it, right? It's latency. You have to wait for the two out of three or the three out of five. Like, you need all those to get back to you. So that's the cost. But, uh, you know, there's lots of ways to make that cost bearable. Um, you can create, you know, you can use, just use uh, replicas on the East Coast of the United States, for example. Or you can make sure that you're using things that aren't caught on the East Coast or, say, in Ohio on the East Coast power grid. And then you have something that's in, you know, Houston and in the, in the Texas power grid. And then something that's, say, in Utah on the West Coast power grid. So they're actually close together. They're sort of in the middle. You can get to them from the East and West Coast. But you also get them to, from Central in all of these cases. You've got all three power grids of the United States and the consensus between any node and uh, either Utah or Houston from Ohio is actually pretty fast because these things are kind of grouped in the, grouped in the center. So that's, a, that's an interesting way to go about it. Uh, there, there's lots of others. I won't, I won't get into too much, but you, you do pay that latency cost. Uh, and that's something that, yeah, you know, it isn't always palatable, but uh, I think uh, most companies are coming around to the idea that, uh, you know, if, as long as you can keep that latency reasonable, this is a much better way to run operations in terms of keeping your business online and your customers happy and your engineers happy as well. So a related concept of distributed systems theory is the CAP theorem, the CAP theorem, which basically says there is a trade-off between availability and consistency. How does this concept of synchronous replication fit into this CAP theorem? My understanding is that CockroachDB decided to go for consistency over availability. How did you take this decision? And what's the technical considerations that went into this? So you mentioned the CAP theorem. This is uh, widely misunderstood, for sure. Um, you know, the, the idea that most people take away from it is that 
in building any kind of distributed system, uh, you can either have consistency or availability. Uh, and I think when people think about consistency, it's pretty obvious what you mean. It just means that the database isn't going to ever return you the wrong answer. Like, you know, you hear things like, oh, uh, Cassandra supports eventual consistency models. But eventual consistency means that at some point in the future, you're going to get the right answer. But, it's, you know, <laughs> you, you might not get it when you go and do a read. Not immediately. Eventually, you'll get it. And and that's that's often really bad semantics. And it's absolutely, you cannot build a relational database trying to use eventual consistency. You can build lots of other kinds of things. And certain use cases lend themselves naturally to eventual consistency. I'm not saying it's a bad concept. It's not how you build a relational database. So, uh, you know, that that's it, there's sort of a fundamental mismatch there. So we, we really had to be consistent. The, the, the bigger thing where I think there's more confusion is, is around availability. The CAP theorem has a very different idea of what availability is defined as than what a sort of a, an average operator would expect from availability. If you think about running a system with high availability, right, which sounds like the same thing, it's not the same thing. Like the CAP theorem's availability is very different from the notion of high availability. What high availability typically means to people is that, oh, we're gonna set some SLA, right? Uh, this database is going to have five nines of availability. That's high availability. And you can say, no, it actually needs to have seven nines of availability. Uh, you know, that's what high availability means. It's kind of, kind of like your, your probability of not being able to access the database and make forward progress. What availability means in the CAP theorem is whether any node can be disconnected from the others and make forward progress. So it's, in other words, availability in the CAP theorem is just saying, if you want to let one node uh, always move forward with no agreement from anyone else, then that's availability. So in other words, um, you can create things like availability implies things like split brain and like all kinds of different inconsistency problems. Um, but it's not high availability. You can take cockroach, which is consistent database, completely consistent, and you can give it its arbitrary amount of high availability. If you say you want cockroach to have you know, five nines, then it's really about what's the probability that one of your data center replication sites goes away. And if it's, uh, if it's a very low probability, then you can probably just have three. If it's, if you say that, okay, we want it to be even more highly available in terms of the percentage chance of not uh, being able to use the database because there's not enough replication sites available, then you might say, okay, we can move to seven replication sites. Right? And that's going to give us, you know, seven nines of availability because, you know, it's kind of like, what's the probability that with seven that you lose uh, four or more? So that probability, uh, you, you basically by increasing the number of replication sites, or increasing or decreasing the probability of a replication site going away, you can get to an arbitrary number of nines. So the CAP theorem doesn't argue that you can't make something highly available that's consistent. It basically says that if you want consistency, you can't have any node do what, whatever it wants on its own. So it's a, it's a very narrow definition of the term availability, and it can really confuse people because I think the temptation uh, is to say, okay, if you're going to have a consistent database, then that means that it's not going to be highly available which is, is absolutely false. So I, I think the, yeah, the notion of availability in the CAP theorem is not really what people are looking for. And so it's, uh, it's very misleading to, I think, for the average person that hasn't uh, you know, uh, really sort of explored what it means in practice. Maybe as a last question, Kubernetes. For the listeners, uh, Kubernetes is the container orchestration system that came out of the Google Borg supercomputer project. And it's not a natural fit with CockroachDB because one is stateless and one is stateful. Talk to us a little bit about how this integration works and how CockroachDB has really benefited from Kubernetes. Yeah, I mean, Kubernetes is excellent. It started off being stateless, as you say, but it has added support for stateful workloads. And there's, there's lots of different sort of concepts that go in there uh, and it's constantly evolving. I will point out that Borg, you know, very early on in its life cycle, supported databases as well. I mean, there's there's nothing incompatible with the idea of a, a container orchestration system, or just an, a sort of a deployment orchestration system. Might be a more general way of looking at it, and uh, databases or any kind of state. Like the, the the two things work fine. Just early on, Kubernetes didn't tackle that problem yet. You know, it's just things evolve, right? And so you kind of start with the easier problem, which is stateless workloads, and then you start to add things that can support state. So at this point, Kubernetes does support it. And in fact, we use Kubernetes uh, you know, for our 
managed service. So for Cockroach Cloud, we use it heavily. And uh, you know, all of our customers, eh, not all of them, but the, the majority of our customers use Kubernetes or are you know, very interested in using Kubernetes. So you know, I think that you know, fundamentally what Kubernetes is buying you is a way to uh, you know, automate deployment tasks that used to just involve a ton of hand-tuned, hand-rolled scripts. Uh, you know, bash scripts, Python scripts, uh, you know, just things that, uh, and, and of course, tools that came along like Puppet, Chef, and things like that. Uh, and and now with Kubernetes, uh, there's there's a more uh, agreed upon standard that does more, is increasingly doing more that the whole industry has got, gotten behind. So I think this is one of uh, you know Google's most successful software development projects to date because they did such a good job of uh, you know making it the industry standard by really uh, you know getting it off the ground and, and then inviting you know making it very open and inviting a much larger consortium of, of other companies even some that are directly competitive with Google uh, to contribute I think that's the right model for these kinds of things and Google's gotten a lot of mileage out of that uh, but you know certainly kubernetes would be how we would recommend uh, anyone that's self-hosting cockroach to run it because we now have a lot of experience with it. And it's not necessarily better than other ways that you could do the orchestration. But again, that standardization, I think, is critically important. Yeah, so Spencer, thank you so much for being with us here today. And I have to ask for my friend who saw you on, on Jason Calacanis' show last week, what's your weekly uh, workout regime? Because you've, you look so fit and healthy, um, <laughs> even during this crisis. And, and where can people find out more about you and, and, and what you and Cockroach Labs is up to? Uh, so I'll answer that last question first. <laughs> uh, you know, if you want to find out what Cockroach Labs is up to, uh, the technology blog is, is wonderful. So the blog we have just uh, goes into all kinds of juicy detail about the innovations that we're, that we're working on. Uh, and, and uh, you know, anything around fundraising, we have a lot of stuff in there around people initiatives and you know, how we're tackling um, you know things like our interview process and open sourcing it it's just a lot of interesting things so it, it, it that's it people want more information i can't think of a better place i personally don't have a twitter but cockroach db has a twitter uh, so uh, that would be another place to look if you kind of want uh, you know up to the minute updates uh, you know about my covid regime or regimen it's uh, kept me in some degree of shape uh, you know I, i do this thing called the seven minute workout <laughs> Which is kind of hilarious that it works, but I think what's different about it from going to the gym is that when I went to the gym a lot, even when I had a personal trainer, this was way, way, way pre-COVID, uh, that would be something I might do once or twice a week at best, right? And, you know, you'd work out really hard, uh, you know, you'd burn some serious calories and you'd come away huffing and puffing, but uh, you do it once or twice a week. Uh, with the seven-minute workout, I never miss a day. So it's that consistency, I think, does yield results. And the beauty of it is that because it's only seven minutes, it's not hard to do. So you don't feel like you do after the workout where you're like, wow, I feel really good. In fact, I feel like I'd like to brag about my workout, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, are you doing it every day? No, because it's actually pretty hard. and it, it would really turn you off if you were forced to do it every day. So it's kind of, you know, an interesting balance. Like, can you find a, reg a regimen that is pleasant enough that you can keep it up. So that's one thing I do. And then the other thing is uh, I've started this for the, like maybe the last eight weeks, but I, I just juice until dinner. So you buy these, you know, I, in my case, the press juicery is the, is the place. And it's, you know, these green juices and, you know, I'll drink three or, three or so of them. The, you know, for my body type, at least it, uh, it keeps me in, in really good shape. Uh, I don't know if it worked for everyone, but uh, the other unlooked for benefit, and it's a really funny one, is that every time I eat dinner, I am excited. And that never used to happen. I am excited. I'm like, well, what am I going to have tonight? <laughs> it's, it's like, a, it, it, it's crazy. But, you know, the, the introduction of that level of excitement around food is a, is a gift that is uh, surprisingly precious. So, so it's never juicing, seven-minute workout consistently, and intermittent fasting. I love it. Yeah, yeah, that intermittent fasting, it, it's uh, what's what's great about it is, yeah, you know, the juicing keeps you from being hungry. You're not really fasting, right? You're never like, my stomach is dying here. I'm just going to like pass out or something. It's giving you some calories, but 
uh, the, the beauty is that when you do eat your dinner, I actually feel pretty free to eat whatever the heck I want. So I'm not trying to watch my calories at the dinner time. So it's a nice balance. Love it. Love it.